In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, verse 26, God reveals his plans. He reveals his intentions. And when I was reading this scripture, you know, almost every year I go back to Africa. And when you go back to Africa, sometimes you end up meeting some of your high school mates. And it's so amazing when you go back home, you see those same guys that you used to hang out with. Minister Ike, you, you may understand what I'm saying. You go back home, the same guys you used to hang out with, they are still hanging out at that same place under the trees. And it's been almost 35 years, 40 years, they're still hanging out there. They're playing dominoes. They're playing what we call draft. The same thing they were doing 35 years ago. The only difference is that they're doing the same thing, but a little bit slower. But they're still doing the same thing. Nothing has changed for them. But the fact is that over the last 35 years, a lot of things have changed. And you ask yourself, what did they do with change? What did they do with time? I want you to understand that your greatest commodity as a child of God is your time and your change. What you do with time and what you do with change is so crucial. And you got to be even eager and serious. If you're a teenager, I don't think you have the whole world ahead of you. Time goes like that. Change comes like that. And you better be ready when change comes. You better be ready. You know, working in the hospitality industry, I remember one time we had, we had a training session and the trainer asked, we sell beverage, we sell food, we sell accommodation. What is the most perishable of these three products? Everybody was quick to say, oh, beverage. Some said food. And then they began to argue. Some said it couldn't be food because if we don't sell the food, we could refrigerate it. We could put it back in a cooler and sell it the following day. Some said, well, with the drinks, you don't even have to open it once. Nobody buys it today. You could keep it and sell it tomorrow. And they kept going back and forth trying to figure out what is the most perishable item. And after all the back and forth, the trainer said, you, you, you all got it wrong. The most perishable item we have in this hotel is the rooms. Because if they don't buy the food, you could keep them in the fridge, warm them up tomorrow and sell them. If they don't buy the drinks, you could keep them in a the cooler and sell them tomorrow. But a room that is not sold today is gone. Tomorrow is another day. That room ought to be sold. So the revenue you didn't make yesterday is gone. Never to be recouped. So is it with time. So is it with time. Yesterday is gone. None of us have the power to regain yesterday. It's gone. Never to come back again. We will not get yesterday again. And so what you do with your today is so crucial. And in fact, if you look at your life today, you are just a product of all the decisions you made with your past days. And so it's so key what we do with the time we have and also the chances that happens to us. And as we get into this scripture in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34 and verse 26, you know, Bible says, I will bless my people. And this is God speaking. He said, I will bless my people and their homes around my holy hill. In the proper season, I will send the showers they need. There will be showers of blessings. Did you see that? He says, in the proper season, I will send the showers they need. There will be showers of blessings. But then when I think about this, I think about the fact that as Christians, we feel entitled. We feel we ought to be blessed every time, any time. So there is no reason why we should never be living a day without the blessings of the Lord. But we got to understand that there are seasons that we may go through that are difficult seasons. There are periods in our lives that are going to be challenging and we got to be prepared for it. I tell you, when you get to 50 years, everything in the body hurts. Whether you like it or not, that season is going to come. In fact, if you look all around us, God created a world and placed in it the law of degeneration. Everything in creation degenerates. Nothing remains the same. Everything in creation goes through a process of decay. And so that in itself is change. Change is going to come. Whether we like it or not, it's indispensable. 
And so if you look at even the trees around us, there are seasons where they come out with these beautiful leaves long before you know the leaves are being shed. Fruits come, fruits go. You look at even rivers. I studied rivers and I realized that there are rivers that shrink and there are rivers that grow. Rivers expand, rivers shrink. I even realized that mountains move. I'm just trying to help you understand that change will come. And whether we are prepared or not, that will not stop change from coming. There are so many things around us we could look and see how God plays change in his creations. He says seasons will come. And these seasons in this scripture we just read are going to be seasons of blessing. It means that it's not going to be a perpetual season of blessing. It means that you're not going to have a perpetual life of money coming in. You're not going to live all the rest of your life working until you die. There are certain things that are going to happen. And as a child of God, you can't live into chance and say, well, you know, well, God got me. In fact, the Bible says, before you open your mouth to pray, he knows what you need. So what's the point of me praying? God says he will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We could read all these beautiful scriptures and go to sleep and say, I don't have to do anything. God says, I'm blessed going, I'm blessed coming. But the truth of the scripture is that he will bless the work of your hands. It means that it's your hands that activates the blessings of the Lord. So you cannot be a Christian and be lazy and say, well, God is going to bless me anyhow. No, he says, I will bless the work of your hands. It means if your hands is not doing any work, it's not activating any blessing. You cannot be a lazy Christian. God expects you to be a hardworking Christian. And that is where the Bible says, he that does not work, the same must not eat. It means food eating is for people that work. It means if you are not working, you're a lazy man, you got to be on fasting. Now, when I think about change, it means that nothing remains the same. Nothing remains the same. Seasons means that everything is always temporal. If you're going through a hard patch in your life, you've got to understand that it's seasonal. No season remains the same. A short while ago, we had winter. Not too long ago, we had fall. I mean, we had spring. And now we are right in the middle of summer. Seasons come, seasons go. And no situation is permanent. It is temporal. Now, change means season is an incentive for you to plan for the future. It will be a disaster as a believer not to believe in having life insurance. If you're a believer who don't have a life insurance, you sim simply don't like your family. You don't love your kids. You don't love your spouse. You don't love your family. You're not preparing for death. You should get to the point of even buying your grave down. That is how confident you must be about death. You don't buy your grave. You don't buy all these things down because you fear death. You don't buy these things because you are preparing to die. No, you buy them because you want to secure the future. But when you speak these things to Christians, you're like, you're preparing me to die. No, that's not about it. Whether we like it or not, every single one of us will die one day. None of us is immortal. We will die one day. And it's not a bad thing to prepare towards it. It's good to visit the grave site and figure out where, where are you going to lay me? Where am I going to be laid when I die? Like grandma the other day said, when I die, take me to Africa. Because I don't want to be buried in America. The folks in that graveyard speak English. I don't speak that good English. I don't want to be hanging out with folks that speak, you know, I might not get your accent. Now, please understand that nothing happens unless you change. I'm going to get into your mind in this series because God wants you to change your mind. A lot of us resist change. We fight change. We don't want to have anything to do with change. But change is not your enemy. Change is your friend. Can I say that again? Change is not an enemy. Change is your friend. It becomes an enemy when you are not prepared for it. 
you get frustrated when you are not prepared for it. There are two characters in the Old Testament I think about. I think about Abraham. He is comfortable he's with his family. He has a beautiful place to live. God comes around and says, Abraham, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your home and come with me to a place where I will show you. And then his first question is that, God, where is the place you're taking me? And God says, I will show you when we get there. Now, God would always give you a rough ride and it takes an amount of faith to walk with him when God is transitioning you to a better place. Now, he could have said, I don't want that kind of change. I'm okay where I am. I'm happy with my family. I'm happy with my kindred. I'm happy with a home where I live. You know, sometimes I visit folks in a city. You go to the city and some could pride themselves in the fact that I've been living in this apartment for 35 years. They are so excited about it. Look at how big it is. All I pay is $850. And they are excited about it. That is good. But beyond that apartment being big and eight fifty, God has brought a lot of opportunities. And the question is that what did you do with each of them? Was that the only place God designed for you? There are more things God has in store for you. But if you don't embrace change, how are you going to receive the new things God is bringing your way? God wants you to open up. He wants you to open your mind to receive the change. I think about a man like Moses. He was a prince. He was raised in a palace. He had a good life until God plays in his heart the passion to deliver people. Now, how are you going to move from a place of being royalty, being a prince, to becoming a fugitive? Because we know the story. He kills an Egyptian, and now Pharaoh is after him, and the man who is supposed to be a prince in the palace of of Pharaoh is now on the run. He's a fugitive out there because he killed somebody. He's a wanted man. He's on the list of people that are wanted for murder, and he's on the run. Who wants to leave the comfort of royalty? Who wants to leave the comfort of the palace and become a fugitive with no home? Pretty much homeless. But it took the passion to embrace the change God was bringing into his life. You cannot become what you were born to be unless you are not willing to change into something you are not. And a good number of us are stuck at where we are because we don't want change. We look at the cost of change and we're like, you know what, I don't want to go through that. It's it's painful. It's the reason why women even remain in abusive relationships. Because you think about the fact that 15 years with this guy, he's abusing me. But the point is, am am I going to live all these 15 years? I've invested with this guy and go start with a new person that I don't even know. And then we begin to quote man-made scriptures. The devil you know is better than the angel you don't know. And it sounds churchy it sounds bible it sounds scriptural but it's not in the bible and you are being abused physically you are being abused emotionally and you feel well it's okay whilst the bible says that if it pleases you to live with that man go ahead and live with him and here we talk about divorce and sometimes we we feel that well bible says god hates divorce And sometimes we preach it to the extreme that people get buried in relationships that are destroying them. And you ask yourself, does God really want you to be in that kind of relationship that is destroying you? Or you got to get ready for change. And a good number of us are buried in this kind of situation because we are so scared and afraid to embrace change. You cannot have the new things God has designed for you when you are not open for change. God wants us to get ready for change. I love what Shakespeare says. Shakespeare says in one of his writings, he says, sweet are the uses of adversity. Think about that for a minute. He says, sweet are the uses of adversity. This is William Shakespeare. He says, adversity is those things that are supposed to be uh, the vehicle for change which are uncomfortable. Nobody loves it. Nobody wants to go through that, but that is the vehicle God chooses to transition you from the comfortable place to the best place he has for you. And he says, sweet are those adversities. Who wants to go through adversities and call it sweet? It's painful. It's ugly. 
But God chooses to use those things to bring us to places that are better than where we are. Now, we never grow in good times. I want you to think about that for a moment. None of us grow in good times. It takes rough times to grow us. It takes challenging times to grow us. It takes difficult times. Nobody grows in good times. And sometimes we look at the challenges we go through and we only see the negativity in it. We don't see the good in it. There is always good hidden in the challenge you're going through. And we never advance unless we are under pressure. You remain at the same place until you are pushed, until you are placed under pressure, until you are placed into a situation. I love the Greek word for pressure. It's the word pateo, P-A-T-E-O. It means to be squeezed. When you feel squished, that's when you want to make a move. When you feel uncomfortable. Some of you, your workplace feels so uncomfortable. Everybody is speaking negative about you. Your supervisors, your managers are on your tail. Everybody seems to be on you. But the reason is because it is time for you to move out of that place. And sometimes you are so slow, it might take a manager firing you. And that firing must never be taken negatively because sometimes you are being fired from that which you thought was the best into that which is the ultimate of God. I remember one time I used to work for um, a hotel. I was the cost controller and uh, my boss was a financial controller. And this guy was from Holland. He was a terrible racist. Every negative word you could ever use to describe him was in a book. And I remember at a time we had a, a, a collective bargaining agreement. If you work with a union, you understand what I'm saying. And one of the rules was that if you ever got three write-up within a calendar year, you were automatically fired. And this guy was trying everything possible to make sure that he gave me three write-ups so I get fired. He gave me the first one, gave me the second one, and then he gave me the third one. And I tell you, it was back in Ghana where we don't pray for 30 minutes and, and drink coffee and have a sandwich and go to sleep. When we go for all-night prayer meetings, we start at 9 p.m., we stand on our feet, we pray until 6 in the morning. And folks will be like, what? Yes. Because the demons in Africa are bigger than the ones here. When you live in Africa, you got to have a different level of faith. You don't even come home just switching that switch to your life. When you're about to switch that switch in your room, you got to go palaba, si talaba, bra. Then you turn it on. That's how the light comes on. You don't just turn it on because you have a switch. No, you got to have faith to turn on the switch. In Nigeria, they call the electric company NEPA, N-E-P-A. It's an acronym, Never Expect Power Always. So it takes some faith. It takes some faith. So your demons will determine your prayer. No, you don't have to pray for a lot of things in America. In, in Africa, when you are fired, you got to go believing God for the next meal. In America, when you are fired, there are food stamps. There are unemployment benefits. There is a yellow chip you are giving. There are all kinds of promises. Why would you believe God for that? Hebrews chapter 11 says that hope that is seen is no longer hope. What you are hoping for, if you get it, why do you continue to hope? He says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now, when I see it, why am I hoping for it? You got to hear, why do you have to pray for it? We pray more because there are more things we don't have in Africa. You have so much here, you don't have so much to pray for. But how I wish we could understand prayer because when you have it, prayer never ends. Prayer is the answer to answered prayer. When you are praying to God, requesting for something, and God even provides that thing for you, your prayer of request transitions into a prayer of thanksgiving. And that is why prayer never ends. 